Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, what a privilege it is to have Carl McCall at the helm. I'm delighted that our trustees and presidents are here, and of course, I'm delighted that each and every one of you made such a superior effort to be present for this discussion and, and debate. Uh, last year in Buffalo, we held our first uh, Critical Issues in Higher Education Conference uh, on the role of higher education in economic uh, development. Uh, had many, many diverse opinions exercised by faculty, uh, experts in the field of higher education, business leaders, uh, faculty, uh, staff, and students. So here we go again. So just as we have come together for this conference, SUNY has been working on coming together as a system. Uh, we do have 64 distinct campuses with their own identity, but what we are trying to do is to leverage our strengths to have greater collective impact on our students, the businesses we work with, and the communities we serve. University systems, it is our argument, embody the potential to rebuild our state's economy, to improve the delivery of public education, and to populate a workforce relevant for the 21st century. These are daunting tasks that we believe no one group dare tackle on its own. Rather, it takes the full force of a coordinated, collaborative university system to rise to these occasions a system in which all involved are committed to the vision and willing to work together to see that it is achieved. So this year's theme for our Critical Issues Conference, Harnessing Systems, Delivering Performance. Over the next two days, you'll hear from many people we have intentionally gathered together to pose one striking question, uh, commentary on both sides of the issue, do systems add value or do they just get in the way? It's my challenge to each and every one of you that you look at systemness from every angle and help us make these determinations. And for my part, to launch this conference, I'm supposed to make the best argument I can in favor of systemness as a means to drive our future successes in education, economic development, and the quality of life. So here goes. I, I am going to start with SUNY's systemness weathering the storm because even though you all know about Superstorm Sandy, you may not know the way in which SUNY as a system has responded and helped in New York's recovery. Just north of New York City, SUNY Maritime has served as a staging area for relief and recovery workers from across the system and around the country. And on Long Island, Stony Brook has provided accommodations for neighbors and displaced patients. And because we're a system, we were able to move equipment and personnel to the campuses that needed them most. So the value of SUNY systemness in times of crisis is indeed a powerful force. So how did we become so impactful? Well, as Carl uh, alluded, this concept, this word systemness, cannot yet be found in the printed dictionary, but we're working on that. It's uh, as yet an unofficial status, but it does not diminish our power, especially in higher education, where it describes the core strength of today's public university systems and how they are promising and delivering far more than our educational forebears could ever have imagined. Coordinated innovative systemness in statewide universities is proving to be a powerful game changer. And many of today's universities view themselves as anchor institutions enterprises that are not likely to pick up and move away because of their large size and deep roots in community. They are, in effect, anchored in place, serving as a reliable and powerful force for economic development and natural contributors to the local quality of life. So SUNY, for example, was established in 1948 to answer the educational needs of an increasingly diverse population. But at its founding, SUNY was decidedly not meant to be any kind of educational powerhouse. Rather, it was intended to be more of a catch-all, a supplement to the work in cooperation with the state's, quote, priceless, 
private colleges and universities, unquote, said Governor Thomas Dewey. But in 1958, Nelson Rockefeller, as governor of New York, set SUNY on a new course and provided the first glimpse of our systemness. State teachers' colleges became liberal arts colleges, community colleges rapidly expanded, and students began supporting the system directly by paying tuition for the first time. Importantly, SUNY faculty undertook significant scholarly research at four university centers on Long Island at Stony Brook and in Albany, Binghamton, and Buffalo. Rockefeller's vision was strikingly parallel to that of President Lincoln and Senator Justin Morrill's uh, vision for national higher education. They each saw the potential of university systems to in some way offer all things to all people. And of course, that vision the Morrill Act of 1862. And that's where it all began. So when we talk about systemness, we can't help but put it in the context of the Morrill Act, celebrated 150 years of that vision this year. So it was that visionary legislation that introduced the idea of colleges and universities being the driving force that could make the American dream a reality. As Morrill once summed it up, the fundamental idea was to offer an opportunity to larger numbers for the industrial pursuits and professions of life. So Morrill's vision and his words have the ring of profound foresight for national need, advancing what we now know as the triad of teaching, research, and service. Out of the Morrill Act grew the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities, we call APLU, uh, supporting these 109 colleges who were getting federal funding uh, through the purchase and sale of public lands. Of course, that was then, and this is now. So the diverse sectors in SUNY are now supported not only by APLU, but by ASCU, by ACE, by AACC, by the AAU, and of course, by the National Association of System Heads. But the institutions set up under the provisions of the Morrill Act and even the trade associations of today didn't and don't operate together as a system or a network. Between and among us, there is no universal or agreed upon curriculum, no transfer pipeline or assurances of articulation, no umbrella for administrative oversight or shared administrative functions. So we're there as trade associations as university systems, but not as yet well connected for our systemness. So just uh, surely, Justin Morrill, if he were here among us today, wouldn't that be fantastic? We would try to convince him to look at SUNY and university systems as a 21st century inspiration for his original vision. So SUNY is the largest comprehensive system of public education in America. 64 campuses spread across every sector. If you're from New York, chances are you uh, or a member of your family or someone you know is or has been a SUNY student, a faculty member, or a business partner. And SUNY campuses reside within 30 miles of every New Yorker. So one of the most important factors contributing to SUNY's growth and to institutions that aim to be competitive is that we have at our core an identity, a vision, and a plan. And we make it our business to know what New York needs and we find a way to provide it. But we can't do that alone. A vision is best derived through the collaborative uh, reflections of ideas and ambitions and determinations of all of our stakeholders and a broad base of contributors. The plan SUNY is utilizing now, the power of SUNY, was launched in 2010 following a 100-day statewide tour and conversation with our 64 campuses and in many subsequent statewide conversations evolved six big ideas or driving tenets of our strategic plan. We are answering New York's call, working to reduce our carbon footprint, supporting research innovation and new ideas, 
preparing students across high need careers, training doctors and nurses to address a shortage of health care workers, partnering with schools and communities to seal the leaks in the education pipeline, and supporting vibrant communities. Bolstering economic vibrancy and improving the quality of life throughout the entire state, campus by campus, community by community, region by region. No question the contemporary challenges we face in these early decades of the 21st century are the gist of headlines. Steeply declining state appropriations, wavering federal investment in research, an aging physical plant, upward pressure on tuition and alternative instructional delivery systems. Today and repeatedly we've heard the federal call for reduced college costs, increased productivity, and a stronger commitment to degree completion for college students and adult workers. And we agree this iron triangle of challenges must be bent in the direction of bringing down our administrative and operational costs so that more of our funds can be invested in student services. We must, in short, do what we call getting down to business, making our sector more nimble, more accessible, more transparent, and above all, more efficient. Critics can condemn this efficiency mentality as an attribute of business, one not appropriate for higher learning. But I think Jim Collins got it right. We must reject, he said, the idea, well-intentioned but dead wrong, that the primary path to greatness in the social sector is to become more like a business. Most businesses, like most of anything else in life, have a desperate need for discipline. Disciplined people who engage in disciplined thought and who take disciplined actions. A culture of discipline is not a principle of business, he says. It is a principle of greatness. And of course, higher education has historically embraced this principle to think and act in strictly a disciplined manner. And it is our assertion that this way of thinking, of doing business, should shape university systems for the 21st century. But our greatest gifts remain improving the quality of life among our citizens, increasing access and the distribution of a standard of living that closes once and for all the immense poverty divide in this country, and ensuring that the best and brightest ideas get translated into a better economy and a better life for people in America and around the world. But our greatest gifts pose our greatest dilemma. If we are the most preeminent higher education system in the world, producing more knowledge and innovation and educating more of our population than institutions in other countries, sought after by parents and students literally all around the globe, why is America still facing so many seemingly daunting and unresolvable problems? In short, what is the relationship between our magnificence and the problems of the world in which we live. We must ask, how can American higher education put its imprint on the most challenging problems of the day? A few pages from SUNY's playbook might help characterize the magnitude of our collective opportunity, examples that will be expanded upon in our concurrent sessions. Going global as one of these examples. American public universities were founded to be everyone's university, places where everyone has a chance to get an education and build a better life. So we need to make it easier for students from all walks of life to apply to college, to be accepted, and once enrolled, to have access literally to the world, whether it is our faculty conducting research overseas, our students studying abroad, or our administrators partnering with their counterparts in foreign countries to deliver a more universal education. In just the last couple of years, for example, SUNY's Office of International Programs has evolved into what we call SUNY Global, a genuine global powerhouse that has expanded partnerships in China, Turkey, and Russia, to name but a few. And we have also opened a SUNY campus in South Korea and worked with leadership in Malaysia, as you've heard, to bring cradle-to-career education 
to its communities. If it is preeminence we are aiming for, if we want to lead the world in higher education, going global is critical. What about shared services? One of the clearest measures of a university system's strength lies in the benefits that being a part of a system provides to each of our components. This is the case for all institutions under our umbrella, who not only gain prestige by offering within the system, but by becoming unified and having more resources at their disposal. There's a reason some of the country's largest university systems have implemented shared services. In New York, in Georgia, in Texas, in Wisconsin, we have learned that by generating cost savings on the whole, our systems and our individual campuses are collaboratively maximizing revenue. And their ability to expand access and to increase the quality of academic programs and other services can directly benefit our students. Like enhanced program offerings, academic advances, and the hiring of more full-time faculty in, in a, every region of New York. And what about student mobility? Our chair mentioned how we've struggled with this issue. But a university system is only as strong as the students it educated, educates and the success they enjoy as a result of the education they've received. To ensure that our students graduate and to promote efficient time to degree, fluid and easy mobility within a system is critical. All colleges and campuses within a university system must work together to guarantee seamless transfer. This is one of the advantages we have as a university system, this ability to engage and serve students at every stage of their work by offering thoughtful articulation and transfer mechanisms within the system that shorten time to degree, save students money, and get them into the workforce ready and willing to contribute to their local economy. And that's where strategic enrollment management steps in. Working hand in glove with student mobility, universities can devise a funding model that takes into account the types of degrees and programs campuses offer, as well as the jobs and training needed locally, providing more support for those programs that graduate students for high need careers in their regions. Strategically, managing enrollment should be the duty of any and all university systems, essential to ensuring that campus programs and majors are applicable to the current job market. In New York, we call this the SUNY Advantage. It means balancing demand for STEM graduates and nurses and special education majors while also, hear me, also accommodating offerings in the arts and humanities, which is so critical to the creative, communicative, and team-oriented workforce of today and tomorrow. And of course, there is our work in research and innovation. In addition to meeting existing workforce demands, we are constantly focused on where the knowledge economy is headed. Building on what we call the innovation ecosystem, it is our campuses and the faculty inventions that are created and validated by partners in the public and private sectors on the path to commercialization and where our students and faculty alike adopt an entrepreneurial spirit. The value of growing research and new knowledge cannot be overstated. Perhaps most important, however, of these examples, higher education must embrace what I believe to be its outright responsibility to reach beyond college campuses in the opposite direction, becoming immersed in schools and communities and aiding in educational reform pre-college. We must partner with our K-12 schools, local businesses, and civic groups to play a role in every child's education, cradle to career. Then and only then will we build the more educated society that is the foundation of economic growth and engaged citizenship in every community, in every state, across the country, and around the world. The full potential of systemness will best be realized once schools, colleges, business, parents, elected officials, and civic organizations in every region agree to educate more children, educate them better, and educate them together. This all sounds great, right? But I have to go back to this vexing dilemma if we're so good and so disciplined, 
why aren't more of our societal problems getting solved? It is because we are not approaching problem solving with the same discipline required to move this country from good to great, or more accurately, from great to premier. It's because we have not engaged in a strategy reported by FSG called collective impact. The idea that genuine change, real improvement on any social issue requires cross-sector commitment to evidence-based interventions by a group of passionate and dedicated leaders who are willing to set aside their individual agendas and work together to solve a specific social problem in which they all share an interest. Our commitment to some degree of intentional systemness, that the whole should be greater than the sum of its parts, should be the guide for our future. It is easy to see why collective impact is gaining popularity with reformers, policymakers, and advocates on Capitol Hill and in communities across the country. Since Stanford called attention to it last year, hundreds of individuals and organizations across the globe, including the White House, have started to ex explore collective impact as a means to solve the most complex social problems of our time. University systems, after all, have the capacity to have a greater collective impact than any organization in America. Colleges are the sources of a wide range of jobs. They act as incubators for new ideas that create innovative jobs, and they train their students to fill those jobs, literally building the workforce of tomorrow. And the populations of communities that host colleges and universities tend to be younger, better educated, and more diverse shaping the region's makeup now and for years to come. If one college or university can have a profound impact on its local community, imagine then what a coordinated, fine-tuned university system can do on a large scale across a region or an entire state. So as we strive to be the world's most formidable higher education enterprise in the 21st century, University systems need only to embrace our potential for collective impact. You will recall Tom Friedman defined for all of us the flat world in which we live today. Now he adds, quote, we have a huge natural advantage to compete in this kind of world if we just get our act together. He goes on to say, in a world where the biggest returns go to those who imagine and design a product, there is no higher imagination enabling society than America. In a world where talent is the most important competitive advantage, there is no country that historically welcomed talented immigrants more than America. And in a world in which the returns on innovation are staggering, our government funded of funding of bioscience, new technology, and clean energy is a great advantage. If only, if only we could come together on a national strategy to enhance and expand all of our natural advantages, more immigration, more post-secondary education, better infrastructure, more government research, smart incentives for spurring millions of startups. Nobody could touch us. We're that close. We must harness our systemness and drive our performance for the greater good of our students, our faculty, local employers, and communities at home and around the world. That is indeed the value add of systemness. Thank you.